Welcome to ProScan's Vignettes. And today we're going to cover a subject that may be a little foreign and a little intimidating to many of you, advanced descriptors for rotator cuff pathology. So let, let's get right to it. And the story begins with the anatomy and the variations of the cuff itself. Now, you should know that the, the cuff consists of a number of structures, a number of muscles, a number of tendons, the capsule, the biceps. But right now, I just want to hone in on the basic tissues. So let's start out with uh, a structure that we'll call the supraspinatus complex. And to the viewer's left, it consists of a muscle. The muscle coalesces, as most muscles do, into a myotendinous junction. And then it becomes purely tendinous. There is a period where you get a little bit of mixture of both muscle and tendon. In the shoulder, in many people, there is an area of less vascularity as the tendon continues more peripherally. And this is known as the critical zone. It's seen at about one to one and a half centimeters medial to the insertion of the tendon on the head of the humerus. There's an area of fibrous condensation or thickening of the cuff, of variable thickness and size and width. And this is known as the cable portion of the cuff. The cuff continues on as an arcuate structure. This arcuate segment, distal to the cable or more lateral to the cable, is called the crescent. And then finally, the cuff inserts on the humerus, in this case, the humerus greater tuberosity as a foot plate or a footprint. Remember that the foot plate or footprint is not an articular surface. It's not covered by hyaline cartilage. The articular surfaces are over here. So if you have a tear in this location, it's more appropriate to describe this tear as landing on the humeral cortex in the foot plate or footprint. Now let's take a more anatomic and less diagrammatic approach, even though this is a diagram. But this is a truer representation of what a portion of the rotator cuff might look like. And once again, we've selected the supraspinatus. We see the muscle and the muscle fibers, the myotendinous unit, and how they, they mix together. And the muscle fades away. The tendon becomes more prominent. And the tendon is composed of a number of tendon fibrils or subunits. It makes an arcuate turn to insert on the foot plate or footprint. Beneath the tendon and medial to the foot plate or footprint is an area of the humeral head that is intraarticular but is devoid of hyaline cartilage. This area which I'm outlining for you now is known as the bare area. The bare area enlarges as you get a little bit older. The rest of the humeral head is covered by hyaline cartilage seen here in aquamarine blue. Now when, the, when the tendon comes around, it doesn't come straight down. It comes down in an arcuate way, but it is also curving towards you or out into the screen. So it has both a downward curvature and an anterior curvature. To make matters worse, there are other structures that are coming from the back, like the infraspinatus, which may slide up underneath it to form its footprint, and the two footprints may commingle or interdigitate. Let's take a basic concept before we get into advanced descriptors. The concept of a concealed or hidden lesion versus a non-concealed lesion. Concealed means that the surgeon or viewing arthroscopist cannot see the lesion from either the superficial surface coming from the deltoid approach or by going inside the joint and looking arthroscopically. This is an example of a concealed lesion. You can barely see some discoloration of the rotator cuff due to the underlying abnormalities in the substance of the cuff, but that abnormality does not extend through the superficial fibers. And I have it covered up for that specific purpose. On the other hand, the non-concealed lesion is 
the lesion that you can visualize, in this case, from the arthroscopic surface. So you're seeing it along the undersurface when you bring the scope from the inside out. This is a specific type of non-concealed lesion called a Stoss lesion. Here's our concealed lesion now where we've taken the fiber covering off and now what was concealed is now visible from the superficial surface looking from the outside in. So what was concealed has now become unconcealed. Well, this concludes the vignette, the, the first launch and part of the Pomerantz Mentor Series and we've focused on the subtle differences in anatomy as we move along the course of the tendon anatomy from medial to lateral. We've also shared with you some very subtle intraarticular anatomy as it relates to the cuff. And we've just begun to touch on some of the unique names given to partial thickness tears and how they might influence their ability to be seen in their management. Stay tuned for more of these partial thickness tears in our next upcoming vignette. Thanks.